Sure, good evening. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about solar thermal. Uh, I think a number of you were here last night, and so uh, you also had a chance to hear a brief, or two nights ago, a brief primer on solar thermal. How many, just to show of hands, how many people here don't know what I mean when I talk, when I say solar thermal? I almost thought I could sit down, but anyway, <laughs> so there's some of you. So um, I'm going to go a little more in depth. I've got some props. I'll, I'll show you, try to explain, demystify it if it needs to be demystified. Uh, I'm going to go through an introduction into the different types of solar thermal that are available. Uh, I'll get into some case studies, which will actually give you some hard numbers to give you an idea. What does this stuff cost? How much will it save me? And then uh, questions and follow up at the end. I like to try to keep it as informal as we can. We've got much more time tonight, so as long as they're uh, not long questions, if a slide that I put up is confusing, if somebody has a question, don't hesitate to throw your hand up. So first of all, who, who am I? Who are we? Uh, I, I'm part owner of a company named Quantum Renewable Energy. Uh, we're a local Kingston company. We've been operating for six years now. Uh, we just do solar and wind power systems. So we install solar thermal, photovoltaic and wind power systems. And to date, uh, in the last six years, we've installed over 550 solar thermal collectors between pool and uh, uh, solar hot water. So let me start off with the two different types of energy. And again, anyone who was here the other night, I think you already know the difference. PV, which is a mouthful when you first say it, photovoltaic, is solar electric. We're producing, we're using solar energy to produce electricity discovered a long time ago, 1839. Solar thermal is simpler technology as opposed to converting the energy that's available into DC electricity. We're simply capturing the heat that's there. It's a greenhouse effect. It's your car on a day like today when it's freezing cold outside, but inside the car it's nice and warm. Uh, we've got some, we've got an absorber inside and the solar comes in through the, uh, through the window. It's typically 50 to 85 percent efficient and uh, I compare that to what a photovoltaic panel is at 10 or 15 percent efficient you can gather that you get a better payback with solar thermal and let me just make sure I clarify by no means am I saying don't do photovoltaic because we also do photovoltaic systems and they, they have a, a purpose and a place but of the two solar thermal makes the most sense if you're going to do anything to start with uh, what we've seen in the solar industry in general over the past four year, or, uh, past six years, we've seen roughly a 40% uh, growth. Uh, that's worldwide. Uh, a lot of the reasons behind it is technology is advancing. I will show you and tell you that uh, solar thermal technology really hasn't changed an awful lot in the last 25 years. Again, it's very simple technology, but some of the control systems we have are improving with computerized age. Um, and with all of these improvements, we're slowly starting to drop the price of components. And so at the same time that the price is dropping, cost of energy is increasing, and there's a tipping point there. Um, I like to think we're past that tipping point where solar does make sense. It is economical to do. So let me talk about uh, some of the acronyms and some of the different systems we're going to talk about. So SDHW stands for Solar Domestic Hot Water. So that refers to a system that's heating water that you're going to use for hand washing, showering, uh, any domestic hot water use that you might have in the household. Combination systems, typically what we see, that's, that's a big catchphrase for all sorts of different systems. So typically we're going to see maybe a solar hot water system combined with space heating or it might be pool heating, uh, any combination of different applications. Straight solar air heating. This is where we'll just be heating the air with an absorber. And the final one is solar pool heating systems. This, uh, I think everybody who was here two days ago saw this. I, I love to pull this slide out just to reiterate how, what our solar resource looks like. And this, you know, if we're down in the equator, this would look quite different. But since we're in Canada, uh, summertime, we get almost six times as much energy as we do in November. Uh, what does that mean? Well, we take a look at our heating load, and this is our heating load. We need all that heat at two times when we've got the worst resource. And that's usually how I try to explain to people when they come up and say, I want to heat my house with solar. They say, we've got the least amount of heat, 
uh, available when we need the most heat. So it's not a great match. Doesn't mean it's not possible, it's just not a great match. If we look at domestic hot water heating, uh, we see a much, a much better match. I love to pull this out too. This right here is called cooling mode. Cooling mode is not significant in most of Canada, Ontario and Quebec it is. Uh, and all the U.S., it's quite a significant load. So if and when we can figure out how to effectively use solar thermal to cool, as they are starting to, um, that's the golden egg, so to speak, because that's where the resource matches the, the demand perfectly. The components of the system, uh, very simple, a collector on the roof. We circulate uh, a freeze-proof solution through there, typically. Uh, we use a, a glycol, a propylene glycol, so it's not what you've got in the car, which is ethylene glycol. It's a food grade product. I brought some props. One of the props I meant to bring was a Twinkie because they use propylene glycol also or any chewy <laughs> granola bars. It's the, the tub we buy at the 45 gallon drum and actually says kosher glycol on it. So it's, it can be used for more than one product. So this is, this is the, the plumbing code has put this into place because if there's any way that we could contaminate your water, we don't want to contaminate it with ethylene glycol, which is deadly. So this circulates through a heat exchanger. That's prop number one. That's what a heat exchanger is. It's called a stainless steel flat plate heat exchanger. Looks pretty small, uh, but a lot of surface area there. With this, we've got glycol stream on one side, water stream on the other side. We'll transfer the heat over into a storage tank. And that storage tank now supplies the water for your conventional tank. This can be an electric tank, a gas tank, oil, an instantaneous tank. Uh, it can be any sort of uh, conventional hot water system. What it looks like in the basement is that. So there's your electric hot water tank. Here's where this would be our cold water supply coming down. We've gone into this tank, preheated the water, got a thermometer up there so we can see how hot it is, and we go back into this tank. So the goal is ideally to heat that water completely in the middle of the summertime if the system is designed properly. It will do that throughout the summer. Uh, days like today, it can do majority of it also, but through the depths of the winter, it's just going to be a slight preheater. Just one question. If there is a compressor in it, does it, does it make noise? Uh, no compressor. There is a circulator. There's a small uh, circulating pump uh, that will move the fluid, will circulate the blew it up. Uh, there is some noise associated with certain systems. We, we have had in the early systems that came out with Betterworks, this is a Canadian company, there was uh, some noise issues. Now they've been able to alleviate most of those noise issues. Uh, some of the other systems we use use a Grundfos pump, which is so silent I've got to actually typically hold it to tell that it's working. So it's typically we'd say no. You wouldn't notice the noise in the basement. You might, but these are usually located in your service room. So let me talk a little bit about the two different types of systems. This is where, when we've got customers coming to us, this gets very confusing because they'll say, hey, we've got this flat plate system, or we've also got an evacuated tube system. And they'll say, well, which, which is better? So let me explain the difference between the two. This is what we typically call a flat plate <coughs> system. And this is what your, I talk about low, low technology. It is very low tech technology. You've got a pipe. This fin right here is called the absorber. It collects the heat, and there's a thin tube that runs up the middle, and that, that transfers the heat to the glycol. Now we put it inside.